Hello and welcome to the Risen Jesus Podcast with Dr. Mike Lacona. Dr. Lacona is Associate Professor in Theology at Houston Baptist University, and he is a frequent speaker on university campuses, churches, conferences, and has appeared on dozens of radio and television programs. Mike is the president of Risen Jesus, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. My name is Kurt Jarris, your host. On today's episode, we continue our series on the historian and miracles. Two weeks ago, we looked at a Scottish philosopher by the name of David Hume. And uh, last week, we looked at C.B. McCullough and his justifying historical descriptions, where we really got a taste for the idea that philosophical concepts uh, can inform and lead to one's view of how we use the historical methods. And on today's episode, we're going to be looking at a historian named John Meyer. Uh, Mike, maybe you could tell me a little bit about John P. Meyer, and and does he have any relation to the Paul Meyer that maybe many Christian apologists are familiar with? Yeah, no, he has no relation to Paul Meyer. Paul Meyer's a Paul Meyer's a great guy. I love Paul. Um, He retired a couple years ago from Western Michigan University, their classics department. He is a he's a historian of antiquity. Um, that's that's where he's focused, and he is focused uh, on Jesus in a number of uh, journal articles and some small books. Great guy, um, John Meyer, also a great guy. Uh, not trying to take away from him, but um, uh, Paul Meyer's Lutheran too. John Meyer is Catholic and teaches at Notre Dame, and John Meyer is known as a historian of Jesus. He's written a number of volumes called A Marginal Jew, um, and. I believe five volumes he's he's written so um but in uh, he's one of the more more prominent historians of jesus in this uh third quest that's uh, been going on for you know since the 1990s yes okay and so um john meyer h- holds an intriguing uh position in your spectrum of uh the historians that you're analyzing here in your chapter on the historian and miracles in your book the resurrection of jesus a new historiographical approach by university press and and we've been working through this uh so the interesting position that he uh presents here is that uh, you can believe that miracles happened um but he says uh that we can't use the historical method to come to that conclusion. Uh, is that a fair assessment of his position? Yes, it is. Um, yeah, he, that's, that's exactly right. And he gives a number of reasons for that. So, I mean, Meyer has been one that uh, has relied heavily on what uh, New Testament scholars refer to as the criteria of authenticity. Is it uh, attested in multiple independent sources, um, embarrassing sources, sources that are embarrassing to the cause, um, early sources, eyewitness sources, uh, things like this. So, um, uh, and so he looks at a number of things about Jesus as, all right, we can verify that this happened. Here's some things we cannot verify, or this probably did not happen, he would say, with a number of, of things about Jesus. But when it comes to miracles, he says, we cannot verify, as historians, we cannot verify that a miracle occurred. Mm. Okay, and so what are some of the concerns that you have with Meyer's approach here? Does it have two hard and fast lines between that which we can know from theology and that which we can know from history? Yeah, um, yeah. like one of his objections is that uh, to say that God raised Jesus is to make a theological claim, not a historical one. And he is correct to a certain extent, but he says, you know, historians can't verify that God raised Jesus from the dead. I would agree with that. Um, however, I do think that that doesn't say that historian couldn't say that Jesus rose from the dead. So um, let me let me unpack that a little bit. And you know, as, as we get into this, there's just so much when we talk about historical investigation and whether um, historians can verify a miracle claim. And we all have different ideas. And you know, you present your ideas out there to the academy. And then you get response from scholars, and a lot of times those responses can fine-tune what you think in, in different ways. It can show flaws. I mean, this is the importance of the criti- um, critical review method, uh, mm-hmm. uh, process. Um, so, and I think that, you know, Meyer comes up with some, some, some neat ideas here, but when they're reviewed, at least on, on this basis, on whether historians can investigate miracle claims— 
to have ex, uh, external eyes looking at this critically, I think we can show some flaws in this. So, for example, he says, again, to say that God raised Jesus is to make a theological claim. The historian has no tools um, by which they can access God, mm. right? I mean, there's no way a historian has any kind of criteria or tools at their uh, disposal that they can verify that God did something. A scientist has nothing like this either. So, um, and I think we, we may have talked a little about this last week, maybe. Um, um, but here, here's how I'd answer that. I'd say, yeah, we might not be able to say God did it, but that wouldn't mean that we couldn't say the event did not occur. Mm. So um, sometimes I'll give the example of a comet um, that scientists have been uh, viewing, keeping track on a comet for the past decade. And now they've determined that on a certain day at a certain time within the next month, that comet is going to slam into the moon's surface. And so when that day comes, you've got planetariums scattered across the Earth that are focused in, zoomed in on the moon's surface. And same thing with the Hubble Space Telescope. That's been positioned to watch the event. And all of us are just, so many of us, millions around the world, billions are watching this on television. And the comet just slams into the moon's surface. And as the lunar dust settles, there's a message written on the moon's surface. And it says, Jesus is Lord. And it's written in Hebrew and in Greek. Now, scientists would look at that and say, have no idea how that happened. What was the cause of that? What carved out that message? We have no natural explanation for it. They might even say, you know, God seems to be the best explanation for it, but they have no tools to determine that God was the one using that comet to make that uh, message on the lunar surface. So if we're going to take uh, the principle here that says it's a theological explanation, therefore to say it's a miracle is beyond the purview of historians, um, we wouldn't say that the scientists couldn't say the event itself didn't occur, because obviously it had, and we had evidence for that. You would just say that the scientist couldn't say that God did it. Mm. And and this would be a form of methodological naturalism. He goes on to say that, uh, not with the resurrection, but the scientist could say that, not the scientist, the historian could say that an event occurred, it just couldn't attribute the event to God. And I think he's right with that. Now that brings us to a point of methodological naturalism. And that is to be distinguished from metaphysical naturalism. Metaphysical naturalism is the worldview that says that God does not exist, that everything has a natural cause. Methodological naturalism is uh, one of its rel uh, metaphysical naturalism's relatives, but, but says that um, God may do things. He may have created the universe and life, but... That's outside of the purview of scientists, and so a scientist can only look for natural explanations, mm. can only look. So uh, similarly, methodological naturalism in historical method would say that since God is outside the purview of historians, um, the historian can only look for natural causes. Now, that may be, okay, but some— would go so far as to say you couldn't say something like the resurrection of Jesus occurred, like Bart Ehrman. We'll get to him, uh, I think, next week. Um, but some would say you couldn't even say the event occurred because it would require God as the cause, whereas I'd say, no, we could say that using Meyer's form of methodological naturalism, you could say that the event occurred. You just, if if the evidence was sufficient to establish that, mm -hmm. you just couldn't say that God was the cause. So for you, the the chief dispute you may have with Meyer is the combination of the historic the tools of the historian plus philosophy and philosophical assumptions uh, about, say, like even the religious context of a community that observes some event. Um, that's really the crux. It's the combination of the historian, the historical method plus philosophical assumptions uh, yeah. here. Is that right? 
Yeah. So, yeah, Meyer would go on to say, as soon as you say God did it, that takes it out of the hands of the historian and now places it in the hands of the theologian or the philosopher. And see, I, I think he would have been better off just to leave it as it is and to say, look, you could determine that the event occurred. You just couldn't say that God did it. Hmm. You just leave the cause of the event uh, undetermined. But he does go a little further and he says, um, well, uh, what about... You know, that, 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 that would be when you say God did it, now you place it in the hands of the theologian or the philosopher. Well, now that, what about someone like Gary Habermas, who is fluent in both of those? He's a philosopher, you know, he studied theology, but he's, he's got his PhD in, in the philosophy of religion. Mm. And yet for years, he has worked on historical research pertaining to Jesus. So by all means, you know, he is a professional historian. Um, so what do you do? Let's say that John Meyer, now this never happened, but let's just say that John Meyer and Gary Habermas were in a conversation and um, uh, Meyer says to Gary, look, Gary, you say that, you know, you can verify a miracle. Uh, I'd say no, because that means God. And now, you know, the historian can't do that the historian has to punt to the philosopher or the theologian. And Gary says, okay, well, I'm fine with that. I'm trained in both. You know, I, I am by profession a philosopher and a historian. And so uh, why don't you just leave this kind of investigation to me? And henceforth, you biblical scholars, you historical Jesus scholars, just, you know, confine yourself to other matters while <laughs> us big boys um, at the adult table do the, <laughs> the difficult work. Um you know, that wouldn't fly, of course. So, um, yeah. So, right. So, in this case, you say, no, the historian can come to this conclusion uh, using other tools that are available, uh, even if they're from another toolbox. Uh, so, we. I think that is one way to approach it. You know, you could, um, I mean, why not? You've got. If a historian of Jesus says Jesus died by crucifixion, and here's how we know this, um, we look at the, the medical implications that have been published in peer-reviewed medical journals and the things about the pathological uh, effects of scourging and crucifixion. Um, well, they're not physicians, right? I mean, the historian of Jesus isn't a physician, so at least most of them wouldn't be. So what do you do with that? If are, are they acting in their capacity as a physician? Are they now barred from saying that Jesus died by crucifixion? So I think you have to be careful there. Um, I, I guess we could go a step further. Uh, I need to collect my thoughts here. Oh, so I remember Bill Dembski. Um, I forgot if I read it somewhere or I heard him say it in a lecture or a debate. But he, he talked about a scale, okay, kind of balanced scale. And he said, let's suppose on one side of the scale, there is a 10 pound weight and it's up in the air. And on the other side, it's down, but there's a curtain that's covering that. So we don't know what it is. Mm. Well, we may not know what it is, but one thing we do know, it weighs more than 10 pounds, right? So you can infer certain things, even though you may not be able to get to it. Mm. And scientists do these things all the time. Scientists have never seen theoretical entities like black holes, quarks, strings, gluons. These are theoretical entities never been observed. Well, why do we believe without any doubt that these things exist? Why do scientists say this? Well, because they observe certain effects in our universe and they posit these theoretical entities to explain the effects. Mm. And it does a really good job of doing it. And that's why scientists believe these theoretical entities, such as black holes and subatomic particles, exist. Well, in the same way, I think a historian could go ahead and, just like the science scientist, could posit a theoretical entity, God, for example, right? And say, all right, uh, the evidence strongly suggests that this miracle occurred, that this event occurred resurrection, whatever it may be, for which we would have evidence. The evidence strongly suggests that it occurred. Well, we know from all the data we have um, and knowledge we've learned over the years, our background knowledge would suggest that uh, natural explanation is impossible. 
And so we can infer there's a supernatural explanation. And since Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he claimed to be on a mission from God, um, we can posit a theoretical entity being God. Um, that's the theoretical entity behind the curtain. Mm. And and that is the best explanation of the data. So, you know, here you're not making a, um, to get into some philosophical language, you're not making a deductive argument, but uh, an inductive or abductive argument to the best explanation. So when we're, you know, positing this as a possibility, um, we're not just creating it out of thin air either. We're, we're really assessing the data and seeing how these purely naturalistic uh, hypotheses uh, ultimately fail, and there has to be some other explanation. There's something else going on behind the curtain to continue on with the scale analogy there, and and that's our that's what we think is the best explanation. So, yeah. So I, I see that there are there are two options here. You can do that. You can say, I look at the evidence. Um, I see that the evidence strongly suggests Jesus' resurrection or whatever miracle we're going to look at. Okay. Um, now, what was the cause of that event? So one thing you could do is the methodological naturalism approach posited by John Meyer and say, well, we don't have the tools uh, of uh, the, our tools as historians do not allow us to adjudicate. It seems like there is no natural explanation that can uh, plausible natural ex natural explanation that can explain how you know Jesus rose from the dead. So we're just going to leave the cause undetermined because we don't have the tools for that. Um, I do think we could go further and say it's a supernatural event. This is where you know our ability to identify a miracle comes in. Mm -hmm. It's extremely unlikely by natural causes. And it occurs in a context that's charged with religious significance. In, in other words, a, a context in which we would expect a God to act. Mm. And in that case, I think we could say that it is a miracle at that point. So what I would do is offer that to John Meyer to say, all right, here's something that, you know, in interacting with your argument, I think you've got some good things to offer here, but I think we could improve it by you know, looking at the criteria for identifying a miracle. But even if you reject that, you could still say that the event occurred and just leave the cause undetermined. Um, and the other way would be to say, all right, we, I am going to take a stab at the cause here and posit a theoretical entity, God, because it does seem likely, most likely that it would have been God who would have done it. Certainly, we'd have to say that God is probably the best candidate for something like the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, great. All right, um, let's take a question from uh, one of your followers. Uh, this question comes from Nazam. Uh, he asks, uh, and now going a bit broader outside of today's subject here, where do you see the future of biblical studies? So maybe that's um, some of the work here on your Big Resurrection book. Maybe it's uh, on... Um, uh, you know, gospel differences or some other field historical reliability. So just going more broadly, where do you see the future of biblical studies? So, yeah, he's not asking about what I'm working on. He's just asking right. biblical studies. And um, so, first of all, I'll say hi to Nizam. We've had some interactions on, uh, on I think, on uh, Facebook in the past. He's a, a Muslim. Seems like a, a good guy. I like him. So, um, in terms of the field of biblical studies, boy, there's a, a lot involved there. You know, now I only deal with New Testament, right. and so, but there'd be other stuff that would be going on in Old Testament, and I just, I, I don't know. I don't interact with that. I have some friends who are in their Old Testament scholars, and, you know, I'll occasionally ask them some questions about Old Testament um, cause it's just not my lane. Mm. So I can only speak with new Testament. I don't know what the, uh, the future of, of, of what things are going to look like 10, 20 years from now in new Testament studies. Of course, one of the hottest debates right now would be on the legitimacy of the criteria of the so-called criteria of authenticity, which have been around for some time. I think it was Reginald Fuller who came up with these, uh, as applied to Jesus. That'd be things like 
the criterion of multiple independent sources, the criterion of early sources, of eyewitness sources, of embarrassing sources, of dissimilarity, things like this, of, of unsympathetic sources. These are, I mean, these, I think these are legitimate criteria. They're common sense. Um, I think the problem that um, historians of Jesus come into is from the beginning, they looked at this as a, a hard science where it's almost like you could uh, put things through a vending machine, push the button, and the desired result comes out, or like this was going to be some some kind of a mechanism whereby you subject a saying of Jesus or an act of Jesus to the criteria and just push a button and the criteria will determine whether Jesus said or did this or did not do this. Um, criteria aren't magic in that sense, and they can't be used in an overly mechanical sense. Um, but they are commonsensical, of course. You know, if we're going to look at things, whether it's in court or in history, we're going to prefer eyewitnesses who are testifying early. And if it's corroborated by an unsympathetic or even hostile source, that's going to be even better, right? Mm -hmm. If you have multiple independent sources, that's going to be, uh, you know, probably the best we can look at better than if we have a late non eyewitness source reporting 300 years later that event X occurred. So, I mean, these are common sense criteria. If we have a more realistic approach about these criteria and say they add to the plausibility or the probability of an event being true rather than guaranteeing it, well, then I, I think that you, you know, these, if you have more realistic expectations, that helps. Plus, I think that some of the critics of the criteria have offered some good points. Like Dale Allison has said, we want to look for recurrent attestation. That would be like, does the motif keep showing up between the reports? So, for example, I do think that we have enough sayings of Jesus that are multiply attested in the Gospels, from like John and Mark, or, or if there's a, a Q material, um, to suggest that Jesus indeed predicted his imminent death and resurrection. What Allison would say, though, is that since there are a lot of sayings of Jesus uh, to that effect that are not multiply attested um, in two independent sources, we would look through the recurrent attestation. Like, is Jesus, maybe he doesn't say elsewhere, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it, as he says in John chapter 2, but if he says something to that effect on other occasions mm -hmm. in the synoptics, that is recurrent attestation. And then you look at social memory, and, and I think all this put together, you take a more holistic approach, um, you know, will get us to more assured results. So the criteria itself, I think this is the biggest debate that is going on in New Testament studies right now in terms of you know, history. And... So as we wrestle through this and come to grips with historical method more, I think that's where some of the advances are going to be made in coming years. And uh, it, it really sounds like the, the debates are getting into the nitty-gritty of the, uh, the historical method here, and, and it's there that we may even find people's philosophical assumptions continuing to, to wade in or that – I mean, in some sense, as, as we talked about uh, last season about our biases, um, we're going to see those coming in as well. I mean, people may want to have an end goal in mind, so they may adapt the, their view of the methods to fit with that conclusion that they want to reach. And that's something to be discerning about as, as apologists to say, hey, wait a second, well, why would we think that? You know, and then what about these cases? So uh, just like with our episode on uh, David Hume, um, you said, well, uh, well, if you hold that, then, but, but we know about all these other circumstances where people, you know, say people in poorer countries that are good, uh, you know, witnesses to some event. So we have to consider those. So those are good counterexamples or defeaters to criteria that, uh, may present itself in these debates. So, yeah, I think we, um, we will, all of us should keep up our radar to look for, um, biases in the others to, that impacts or affects their 
historical method, because we do want to, if we're truly after truth, if we really want to find truth, we've got to seek it with integrity, right? And we may have our biases, and it's okay to have our biases. We just want to make sure that we, you know, we put checks on them mm. um, so that we can look at things as objectively as possible. Um, so, and historical method must be neutral as much as possible. It must be neutral if we're going to conduct our investigations with integrity. Mm. Great. Thanks, Mike. Well, if you'd like to learn more about the work and ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona, you can go to our website, risenjesus.com, where you can find authentic answers to genuine questions about the historical reliability of the Gospels and the resurrection of Jesus. There you can find articles, ebooks, uh, videos, or even the podcast embedded on the website. And it's just a wonderful resource for those that are wanting to learn more uh, about these topics. If this podcast has been a blessing to you, would you consider becoming one of our financial supporters? You can begin your support today by going to risenjesus.com slash donate. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send us some comments, some feedback about what you think about the podcast. Be sure to give us a review on iTunes if you love us, or the Google Play Store, whatever your podcast app of choice may be. This has been the Risen Jesus Podcast, a ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona.